Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's very special installment of our ongoing book talk series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the great privilege and honor to serve as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. And we're so glad that so many of you uh, have taken time out of the beginning of your uh, Independence Day weekend uh, to spend some time with us and learn about this important chapter of American history that we're going to celebrate all weekend long. Uh, before we get started with the content of today's program, uh, I'd like to go over a couple of technical housekeeping matters, uh, some ways that we love to use this Zoom webinar platform to engage with you, our audience. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, as, as I'm sure you might, uh, for Dr. Ellis uh, as we go through today's talk, you can submit those through the Q&A section of the webinar platform. That's the button at the bottom of your screen, which looks like uh, two little speech bubbles and it's labeled Q&A. Uh, if you have any technical troubleshooting matters, uh, for instance, if you're having trouble hearing us or seeing us, you can go ahead and submit those issues through the chat section of the webinar. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat and answering that in real time. But once again, any content questions for Joe, for Dr. Ellis, can go into the Q&A section of the webinar. I now also have the great pleasure of introducing the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, uh, to get us started. Jane? Let me go ahead and join us once. Here we go. So, okay. Uh, um, so th thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate everyone being here and being with us. Uh, it is a delightful way to start our celebration of the nation's independence with one of the most distinguished scholars of the founding of our country. Um, Joseph Ellis is really looked at as a top scholar about the group of people who formed our country. And one of the fascinating things, if you review his book for which he won the Pulitzer Prize, The Founding Brothers, um, or you, look at his most recent book, which we're going to talk about today, uh, The American Dialogue, The Founders and Us, which is a conversation about what would the founding fathers have, think, have thought about some of the actions that are going on today and the issues of today, is that it's clear that what was so much a part of the founding of our country was political discussion, political dialogue, political debate, that we were founded by a group of people, any one of whom would have taken us in a different direction than all of them together uh, took us. And so we are honored to have a conversation today with Joseph J. Ellis talking about what does the pursuit of happiness mean? Uh, what does we the people mean? What did it mean then? What does it mean now? And how do we look at race, in economic inequality, jurisprudence, and foreign policy with the eye to what might our founding fathers have said? I could give you Dr. Ellis's bio, but if, we if I went through his bio, we wouldn't have time <laughs> to hear his talk. And so let me just give you a quick perspective. He won the Pulitzer Prize for the Founding Brothers, the Revolutionary Generation, the National Book Award for American Sphinx, a biography of Thomas Jefferson, and his in-depth chronicle of the life of our first president, His Excellency George Washington, was a New York Times bestseller. What Dr. Ellis has been able to do is to master the craft of history with all of the documentation necessary, but to present it as a story that comes alive and captures our imagination. And so that is why we are so honored to have him with us today. And I wanna tell you that one of the most interesting and exciting things about today is that Dr. Ellis has said he wants this to be, yes, a conversation with you all, our readers, our listeners. Um, hopefully you're also readers of his book, but if you aren't now, you will be at the end of the time. So to get us started, Dr. Ellis, 
why don't you tell us, why did you write a book called American Dialogue, The Founders and Us? What, what were you trying to say to us as we come upon the Independence Day of our country? Jane, thank you for that gracious introduction. Um, I think what I was trying to do was use the dialogue between Adams and Jefferson or towards the end of their lives, the correspondence, 155 letters they exchanged between 1812 and 1826 as a model. And I thought it was a model that we needed to have before us because in my judgment, when I started writing this book in 18, in, excuse me, in 19, excuse me, 2015, I'm the historian who keeps going back to the 18th century. Um, it seemed to me we had been for many years a deeply divided people and became more so over the years as I was writing this book, 2016 and 2017, and that we had lost the capacity to argue. The constitution itself isn't a collection of timeless truths. It is a framework in which we argue about what those truths are. And, um, and I came to the task believing that two, well, here's a couple of things I believed. Um, that the founding generation in the United States was the greatest collection of political talent that we ever had and, and have had since. Um, that the British historian and philosopher, Alfred Lord North Whitehead once said, there are only two occasions in Western history that he knew of when the political elite of an emerging nation behaved about as well as anyone could reasonably expect. One was Rome under Caesar Augustus, and the other was the United States under this group of people we call the founders. I think that's true. The second thing I believe is that the founders are not and should never be regarded as demigods. They were imperfect human beings. It seems that new nations need to create mytho mythological heroes. Rome has Romulus and Ramus, uh, Spain has El Cid, Britain has King Arthur, but the heroes of America's founding are all real people. Um, and we need to put away childish things and think that they were in any way, for example, inspired by tongues of fire when they sat in Philadelphia during the Constitutional Convention, or before that, this day we're about to celebrate the Declaration of Independence in 76. Not so. Ralph Waldo Emerson, coming right after the founders, said, they saw God face to face. We can only see him secondhand. Well, nobody sees God face to face, including the founding generation. I also assumed, based on a lot of reading, that when we talk about the founders, and Jane alluded to this, we presume they're a, a single political ideological collective, and they're not, they're diverse. They thought differently. Um, if left to his own, Jefferson might have carried us towards anarchy. If left to his own, Hamilton perhaps towards some more um, autocratic form of government. Um, and so we're familiar with the doctrine of balance of powers inside the constitution itself. And I'm saying there is an equivalent balance of power within the generation. Um, and that's the reason that dialogue and argument becomes important and crucial. Um, it's that capacity that we've lost. Third final assumption, uh, and I promise to hush up soon so that we can do, go to the dialogue itself. The third assumption is troubling to a lot of people, but I'll share it with you. That the founders were brilliant and gifted, but they were flawed. Um, they succeeded triumphantly in many respects. They could imagine and successfully bring off 
winning a war against the dominant military power on the planet at that moment, Great Britain. And if you think about it, how many wars did Great Britain lose between 1750 and 1950? One. They could imagine a nation-sized republic that had never existed before. They could imagine the separation of church and state, the creation of a secular society from the point of view of government authority. That had never happened before either. And finally, a principle that political scientists think is crucial and an, an invention of the creation of the founding, the doctrine of federalism, um, meaning that there's shared sovereignty. There's no single source of sovereignty um, in the American Republic, uh, which everyone up to, from Aristotle forward thought you had to have. All those were great triumphs, and amidst the triumphs, there are two enormous tragedies. One is the failure to reach a just accommodation with the Native Americans, and the other is the failure to end slavery. Um, and in that sense, the great achievements of the founding are built upon two enormous crimes. Um, the founders could imagine all the things I mentioned earlier, but they could not imagine a biracial society or now a multiracial society. That they're part of a lost world in that regard. So uh, you need to recognize your, the, the willingness to listen to them and not to make the mistake of an anthropologist who goes to Samoa and tells the, pe the indigenous people of Samoa they should practice the child rearing guidelines of Dr. Spock. They're not gonna be able to do that. Um, and yet, um, in my view, um, there's much to learn from them, especially in our own divided time. The founders went back to the Greek and Roman classics, Thucydides, Cicero, Tacitus, Plutarch, and I'm going back to our classics, Adams, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, Madison, Hamilton. Those are the big, big names. The book I wrote self-consciously attempts to identify four issues on which I think they share wisdom that might help us. One is race. Heavens know we know we need help here. And the major figure is going to be Jefferson, who speaks to both sides of the racial divide. The other is income inequality. The horror is that the United States, which invented the middle class society, and Tocqueville described that when he came in the 1830s, a new thing under the sun. We were the crystal ball for the world, a society where wealth was distributed from the middle out. We no longer are a middle-class society. Um, and we're, it's a second gilded age we're living in here where wealth is unevenly distributed. The third area is the law. Uh, and here I'm talking primarily about the failure of government to do all that it should do or uh, to be harnessed in ways that it should be harnessed. But I bring it down to a discussion of the doctrine of originalism in the court system and have some critical things to say about uh, that tradition and how it's been used. And finally, foreign policy. Um, Washington is my lodestar here in the farewell address, which has meanings now, I think, that it didn't have throughout most of its history. Um, uh, those are the four areas that I focus on. When I started writing the book, and I haven't told people this before, so I'm sharing the secret with you. I thought another area that I knew we should learn about is climate change. And I thought I could use Franklin, who was a scientist, uh, the leading American scientist of the day, the equivalent of a Nobel Prize winning scientist, to talk about climate change because I think we're failing to address the existential threat to our society and to the world. I found I couldn't do it in a way that was historically responsible. Much as I wanted to, I dropped it after trying for several months to make it work. Um, the book I've written has been out there for a while and it's 
and the reactions to it have been themselves divided. But I hope on this conversation um, that we can continue the dialogue that I try to start there. Argument itself is healthy. John Adams thought argument was uh, the highest form of conversation. Um, and I'd like to have us try to recreate that dialogue in the time that remains to us uh, on this Zoom session right now. So back to you, Jane. There, there we go. Um, well, you certainly have given us a lot to think about. now. Before we get into the questions from our, our panel, uh, you know, from our distinguished listeners, there's one thing that we were talking about as we were getting ready. Um, and that is the painting that we all see at the Capitol. Um, and we're coming up on the 4th of July and people go, that's the Declaration of Independence. Is that, is that the 4th of July? Here's the picture. Ah, uh, yeah, it's called the Declaration of Independence. It was painted by John Trumbull. Um, it's um, it's a classic, um, and I think most tourists who come through the rotunda think, understandably and plausibly, that it's the signing ceremony on the Fourth of July. You can recognize at least uh, three of the five people coming up to the desk. The person at the chair is John Hancock. The three people that are recognizable, that's Hancock there, are Ben Franklin off to the right, the tallest man, 6'2", it was Jefferson, and off to the left of him is the stout, his rotundity, they called him, uh, John Adams. Um, and the play, 1776, feeds the notion that this moment is the signing moment. And that's why we celebrate July 4th. The truth is, this painting depicts the moment when the committee, the five-man committee that drafted the declaration, presents the draft to the full Congress on June 28th. It's really June 28th, not July 4th. Adams himself writes to his beloved Abigail on July 3rd and says yesterday, July 2nd, is going to be the day that is celebrated in speeches and orations and parades and illuminations, even gets the fireworks right. But he thinks the day we're gonna celebrate as Independence Day is July 2nd. And the reason he thinks that is that July 2nd is the day that the Congress voted on the resolution from Virginia written by Richard Henry Lee that said, these colonies are and have every right to be independent states. That's the Declaration of Independence legislatively. And that's the second, the day they voted. So why the fourth? The fourth is the day they sent the document to the printer. Um, and he put on the top of all copies, July 4th. Um, the fourth is the day the rest of the world knows what we've just done. There is no signing ceremony. Most of the uh, members of Congress signed the, doc, the parchment copy on August 2nd, but there were people coming and going into the Congress and were signing as late as October. Um, so, we got the date sort of wrong, but I've developed, it's my theory, that Adams and Jefferson together decided to make the fourth right. Because 50 years to the day later, they both died. And when, when Jefferson died, the last thing he said is, is it the fourth? He knew he was dying on schedule. And the last thing that Adam said was, Thomas Jefferson still lives. And actually Jefferson had died earlier. Later, Monroe dies on July 4th, 1831. Madison's trying to make it a, a quartet, but he misses. He dies on June 28th, 1836. Um, 
Henry David Thoreau decides to really put the clamps on it by going out to Walden on July 4th, 1845. So it really wasn't the right date, but we've made it the right date. And we celebrate this coming forth appropriately um, because the founders in our own way have decided to make it okay. What a great story. Now, we turn to the uh, comments that are the questions that are coming in uh, from, the, from the listeners. And I remind you, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we have someone who is asking for you to give a perspective on uh, how do you think about today's Supreme Court decision that upheld the Arizona restrictions on voting? How do you think the founders would have perceived that? Um, that's going to be difficult to answer. The founders in their original formulation in Philadelphia in 1787 didn't believe the Supreme Court was supreme. That is to say, the notion of uh, uh, the Supreme Court ruling in ways that had authority over all the states didn't exist, it comes into existence later. John Marshall begins the process. So their first reaction would have been, how, how are you doing this? Why are you doing this? The second thought that I have is, I think the founders would be surprised that the electoral college still exists and that the presidential elections are held in the way they are held. Um, they didn't like it at the time. And I'm, I think they'd be stunned to believe we've retained it. Um, in the end, I guess what I'd say is the founders would disagree amongst themselves. Jefferson would tend to agree with the right of the state to go about its business without interference. Hamilton and Washington would find that difficult to accept. John Marshall would find it diff very difficult to accept. But that, that in the end, they would believe that the Supreme Court rules, then you have to go along with the Supreme Court. Fascinating. Um, now, we have a, right, a listener who said that she has not been previously aware of your work and is now looking forward to it. And his, her question is this, um, where you assert that there were two failures at the country's founding, uh, not acknowledging the rights of the native people and not abolishing slavery. And you've been writing for 50 years about the founding, uh, founding of this country. At what point in your, in your research and your writing did you come to that conclusion that there were those two critical elements or had, was that something early on? How did, you, how did you come to that and how do you think that uh, history teachers should share that information today? Depends on what level you're teaching. If you're teaching grade school, it's different from high school. If it's college, it's different from, uh, anyway. Uh, but that it came to me early on as a teacher because if you teach this material, one of the reactions you get from students is, oh, wait a minute. If in fact, these men endorsed slavery and refuse to provide justice for the Native Americans, then why should I read anything about them? Why should I take them seriously? Um, that's a moral failure. And once that moral failure is noticed or acknowledged, then all else dissolves. And, um, and one of my tasks as a teacher then from the beginning was to try to say, look, the world, there's a past that existed before you were born that you have an obligation to understand as best on its own terms. Um, and so early on, um, I was aware of the fact, especially on the issue of slavery, that trying to have a discussion about the founders and not calling them the deadest, whitest males in American history was a challenge that as a teacher I had to take on. Um, and on the one hand, embrace the idea that they were gifted, politically talented people. And in effect, they created the liberal state that has come to dominate the world, or at least until recently has so dominated the world, that they are responsible for overthrowing the, the, the monarchies of the 19th century and saving Western civilization from the autocracies of Stalin, 
Hitler and Mussolini in the 20th century. But get ready for irony, time to grow up, time to face facts that the, the, the good and evil can coexist. The thing about the founders that I found interesting that I came to later is that most of them agreed that the cause as they understood it, their values, the values they were fighting for in the revolution were incompatible with slavery. They knew they were living a lie. Um, Washington put it really eloquently towards the end. Let me see if I can read it here. Oh, I don't know, it's that um, it was the most unavoidable failure, he said, of his whole life. Um, that the kind of arguments you get for slavery in the 19th century from Southern defenders of slavery, you don't get that from the founding generation. Um, a lot of them also thought that slavery was going to die a natural death. Jefferson himself believed that slavery was incompatible with the modern world, that slavery was a vestige of the medieval world that we were throwing away. This is a basic enlightenment view and that you don't have to do anything, it's gonna happen. Um, it's gonna happen naturally because slave labor is incompatible with freedom and free labor. It doesn't work that way. Um, and in the end, Jefferson's gonna let you down because Jefferson also believed that African-Americans were inherently inferior. Um, if you wanna look through the prism of race, Jefferson is not gonna look very good. Um, if you look through the prism of freedom of speech, religious toleration, um, a belief in the ordinary human uh, uh, mind, he's gonna look very good indeed. But um, you have to develop an affinity for paradox and irony. And that's probably something that comes later in life. Well, one of our uh, listeners wants to know, do you think there was really any way that the founders could have resolved the slavery issue given the time? Ah. That is, I've brooded that. She's asking the question I keep asking myself every day. And I'll give you the succinct summary of where I'm at in that and let other, this listener and others who share the concern. I've said, these are two tragedies. The failure to resolve the Native American question with justice and the failure to end slavery. There's no question. In that sense, American history is morally irresolvable. On the other hand, were they Greek tragedies or Shakespearean tragedies? By that I mean Greek tragedy, sic volvere parcos, tis the will of the gods, it's embedded, it's unavoidable. No amount of leadership could have changed it. Or is it a Shakespearean tragedy? With the proper leadership, namely the founders, could history have gone the other way? I think my judgment, and this is my judgment, each person needs to think about this for him or herself. I think the Native American dilemma is a Greek tragedy. I don't see how it could have gone the other way because it was driven by the desire of ordinary white Americans to get their own land and pursue their happiness. And it was driven by disease, mostly smallpox, that eliminated the Native American 90% fatality rates in Native American tribes as we, they encountered the white population. Uh, I don't see how it could have gone the other way. Um, slavery, I think, could have gone the other way. Um, there were moments in the 1770s, 80s, and 90s when if things had gone if opportunities had been taken. I think Virginia is the key state here. Remember Virginia in the 18th century included both what is now West Virginia and Kentucky. It's the largest state and it had the largest number of quote founders, you know, prominent founders there. If it had gone the other way, um, but the great tension is the tension between facing slavery frontally and forcing the issue and in the process risking the union because that was the issue. If you raise this question, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, and maybe Virginia are going to leave the union. And 
at that early stage, that would have been fatal to the American Republic as we know it. Um, nevertheless, um, I think that's the book I want to write next, by the way, why they failed and, um, uh, and help us understand that. And so in that, will you answer the question about the, thir the 13, co do you believe the 13 colonies would have approved the constitution if it had abolished slavery? You just asserted that uh, there were several that would not. By then they're states, by, by 1787, the colonies have become states. Um, in the constitutional convention, the representatives from South Carolina are the most outspoken. Georgia goes along with them. Virginia is questionable. Virginia seems to straddle this, but the South Carolina representatives, Pinckney and others, Rutledge, basically say, if you do not assure us that our form of labor, and notice the word slave or slavery is never mentioned in the constitution. It's, it's not kosher to do that. But they say, if you don't give us what we are asking for here in some protection of our labor source, we are going to leave the union. And I don't think they were bluffing. Uh, and then you have to play the tape and say, what would have happened if they had decided to, to present them with that issue? I think what should have, Franklin wanted to make a proposal and that he was persuaded not to do it because it was considered too politically risky. The proposal was to say, for the time being, we recognize that the South, the states of the Deep South who are dependent on slave labor, and they were, Georgia and South Carolina especially, 60% of the population in South Carolina was African American, 60%. Um, we will temporarily recognize your right as long as you recognize that in principle, slavery is incompatible with the values of the American Revolution. And over time, we all agree it needs to go away. Uh, for now, we'll, we will end the slave trade, and, but that the principle itself needs to be established. He was persuaded not to do that. It's brought up in the first Congress and they have a big debate about this, but that the original question what would have happened? I think South Carolina and Georgia and maybe Virginia would have decided not, not to join the union that was created in 1787. So let's turn to, we have two related questions and they really are about um, the fact that to reach a consensus that brought us the Declaration of Independence, there was a significant compromise between the founding band of brothers with, who had many things on which they disagreed, but they compromised to create the nation. How do you see that kind of deliberation, compromise? Um, what, what's happened to it today and what can be done to bring honor to compromise and collaboration? Well, you're, you're, you're putting together two things that are different here. One is, one is 1776, when they come together to declare their independence, and the other is 1787, where they come to get together to declare their nationhood. The first sentence of the most famous speech in American history by Abraham Lincoln is historically incorrect. Four score and seven years ago, that is 76, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. No, they didn't. They brought forth a confederation of sovereign states provisionally united to win the war against Great Britain and then go their separate ways, which is what they did. And the Articles of Confederation, the form of government, which is not much of a government at all, is really a kind of League of Nations. Sovereignty resides in the states. In fact, the bulk of Americans and most of the founders, not all of them, believe that if you create a federal government that has power over the states, you are replicating the tyrannical power that parliament existed, uh, create, uh, exercised, and therefore it's a repudiation of the revolution. Others, Washington included, Hamilton included, believed that 
nationhood was implicit in the American Revolution. And if we didn't become a nation, we would eventually fall apart. So you got this big argument at the end of the Revolutionary War in the, in the Constitutional Convention, the issue you raised is really salient. That is, to what extent is the compromise reached to assure the union and thereby permit slavery to, co to exist in the Deep South, especially? To what extent that, is that a covenant with death? That's what later abolitionists will call it. And some historians now still call it. It's a covenant with death. Um, the problem is, if you don't make the compromise, are you a union that will exist at all? And the answer to that is probably not. Um, I think there's no comparable choice that we as a nation face now that's as morally resonant as that. OK, um, that's uh, but that compromise as a principle can be an extraordinarily helpful and absolutely essential factor, as we see now, let's say, on the infrastructure bill. On the other hand, if it's a compromise based on a principle that leads to something truly tyrannical um, or morally reprehensible, I would say the denial of the vote to black citizens is morally reprehensible. Um, then it's not acceptable. Um, and this is what we need to argue about. Let us take the argument in a, a slightly different direction um, where you talk about the issue of law, jurisprudence and uh, the doctrine of originalism. Right. Can you explain what the argument is between the, the founders and how does that affect today? What, mm. what, where, do you, where do you see? We've got quite a conversation about, uh, you know, is the Supreme Court overreaching, underreaching? You know, mm. how does all that play? The doctrine of originalism trades on the reputation of the founders as a special group of people. In its purest form, it seems the doctor of originalism argues that all Supreme Court decisions and federal court decisions should be made based on what they originally said was the original intent of the framers and the founders, or later said the original meaning of the words the founders used in 1787 and in the ratification process in 1788. So this is a doctrine of jurisprudence that is originally developed by Bork at the University of Chicago and then Yale, Yale and is the basis of the Federalist Society, which is a informal organization of lawyers who share originalist convictions. All of the Republican nominees to the court since 1985 have been members of the Federalist Society. And in fact, that's become, if you're a Republican president, you go to the Federalist Society for your nominees. Um, I think that there are a couple of problems here. One is the founders didn't all agree. So if you say the original intent of the founders, which ones are you talking about? Um, Madison's not gonna agree. And which Madison are you talking about? Madison doesn't, the same thing that Madison says in 1786-87, he doesn't say in 1796-97. He's different. And are you assuming that they're divinely inspired? And they'll say no to that, not to that. But that, um, and if you want to argue about what the original intent of a particular piece of legislation is, you are claiming to be historians. Very few lawyers are trained in history. And lawyers tend to argue on, a, on the one hand or on the other hand basis because of their training and in the, in the, the, the legal system that we develop, you're a prosecutor or you're a defense attorney and you, you shape the evidence according to your client. If your client, and you suppress evidence as much as possible against the client. You, as a historian, you can't do that, okay? Um, 
and therefore it seems to me the originalist the originalist decision that I find most questionable, and this will upset many of our listeners, is uh, DC versus Heller, 2008. It's the decision on the Second Amendment. Um, and the decision by uh, just, uh, Justice Scalia, who is himself a lifetime member of the National Rifle Association, a five to four decision, uh, essentially argues that the Second Amendment provides the right to carry and uh, a weapon, um, and that the right that right is almost uh, as as open ended as the right of free speech. Um, that's not what the Second Amendment said. That's not what Madison thought he was doing. That's not what the Congress thought it was doing when it endorsed it. That's not what the states thought they were doing when they ratified it. The, the term bear arms doesn't mean carry a weapon. It means carry a weapon in a military unit, serve in the army or the militia. Um, and the second amendment was written by Madison in April of 1789 with a specific purpose. It was designed to assure the states that it recently ratified the constitution, but did so with recommended amendments. They, were, they wanted certain changes made. And six of the states were worried about what they called a standing army, that national defense would be in the hands of a standing army. The second amendment was designed to assure them that was not gonna happen, that national defense would be in the hands of a militia, state-based militia. And that's what they thought they were doing. The Militia Act of 1792, which implements the second amendment, essentially required that all able-bodied white males between the ages of 18 and 49 must purchase a musket and an outfit. The original meaning then of the Second Amendment is not that you have a right to bear arms, that you have an obligation to serve. Um, so its meaning has been twisted. Um, and as we experience on a daily and certainly weekly basis, massacres and people purchasing AR-15s, um, it's I'm sure that Madison is rolling over in his grave, um, that his language has been twisted into the shape of an AR-15. And uh, the rest of the world thinks we're out of our minds on this. We have over 300 million weapons in the United States, handguns, war rifles. Um, we have the highest homicide rate in the world. And, um, and it, in my judgment, a Supreme Court decision, I think that if you're a member of the National Rifle Association, you have NRA rights. If you believe in the Supreme Court decision, you have Scalia rights. You don't really have Second Amendment rights. And so the question that our, our writer, our listeners are saying is, originalism complicates, complicates things. Uh, yeah. Surely the founders could not have envisioned guns that can fire 900 rounds per minute Right, right. 1776 musket could fire about every second. Um, Not only that, Jim, but that all the founders who commented on this issue said the same thing. For God's sake, don't freeze the Constitution based on our opinions. None of the founders believed in originalism. Jefferson said, if you you know, the, the, the Constitution should evolve in its understanding and its interpretation. And he said, if we go back to, to the try to go back to us, it would be as if I tried to put on the same coat I wore as a child. Um, so that the irony is the doctrine of originalism is something that the founders themselves found unacceptable. And they would be surprised that that's what. And think about this in Great Britain, let's say, nobody says, what did William Pitt think of that? Or what did Edmund Burke think that meant? Um, in part, that's because Great Britain doesn't have a written constitution. Um, you can always fool undergraduates by saying, where in London should you go to find a British constitution? It doesn't exist. Um, but that my point here is that the, the doctrine of original of all judges, just as all historians are writing and deciding from the point of view of the present. We can't help but be that. That's where we're living. And we carry those convictions with us. 
Um, if you really want to recover the, the, the mentality of ordinary Americans in 1787, 88, they believed the Indians should be removed. They believed the blacks were inferior. They believed that women should not get the vote. They believed that you had to have property to have a vote. Um, a lot of things that nobody believes in now, I would think. And, um, and so that, that, it's, that I think that what's called the living constitution is an inherent, that's what you have to do. The, con the meaning of those words has expanded in time. Um, and, uh, and that we have to recognize that and try to adjust the meaning of those words to our own 21st century conditions. And that's a tricky thing, but don't claim to be uh, doing something historically correct when in fact you're doing something that's more driven by your own political principles. And I would say that about the left or the right. And what do you think? Um, would the Constitution been different if Jefferson and Adams had been there at the convention? You're right, they weren't. Uh, Adams was in London, Jefferson was in Paris. Um, Adams was upset at not being there. And so he, wasted, he spent his time writing a three volume, we're called the Defense of the Constitutions of the United States, using his knowledge of the state constitution as what he think would be a model. Um, I think that um, Adams later on becomes a strong advocate of executive power. And I think he would have wanted the presidency to be more empowered. If you actually read article two of the constitution, it's hard to know what a president can do. The actual powers of the presidency are more shaped by Washington's administration than the language of the constitution. Jefferson is a much trickier subject because the people that oppose the constitution the so-called anti-federalists, especially Patrick Henry in Virginia, said, if Jefferson would he was here, he would be with us. He would have opposed this. And Madison, who is Jefferson's closest friend, says, no, 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 he's my man. I know him. And he's told me he would have endorsed. It. Well, he didn't quite say that. Um, Jefferson was more interested in the Bill of Rights than he was in the Constitution itself. Um, I think over time, it's clear that Jefferson did not believe that the constitution created or should have created a nation. Jefferson went to his grave believing we were still a confederation where the power ultimately resided in the states. The domestic policy was the social province of the states. And in terms of the federal government, the federal government was a foreign government. He did believe that. Um, so. If he had been present, I think he would have kept his mouth shut and let Madison talk for him. But um, over time, uh, Jefferson's views were, were comparable with the values of the Confederacy and Adams's views were comparable with the values of the Union. So now we have a couple of questions that I'm gonna to try to put together because we're running out of time. We could obviously do this for a day, but... Um, Many historians steep themselves in the minds and the times of the study that they're trying to do. So what is your personal, like how do you get into the mind of the founding brothers? And who mm. are the historians that you look at? Did you watch Hamilton and find that inspiring or not <laughs> inspiring? Or give us a sense of, you know, how do you get where you're going? Okay, just on Hamilton, I'm inspired by Hamilton. I think Miranda's a genius. I would have never imagined Hamilton being the hero of a Broadway play. I thought it would have been somebody like Jefferson, much more, you know, but Miranda's a genius and I'm jealous as hell of, uh, of um, uh, Ron Chernow because he's been the beneficiary of that. But uh, all that by the by, I, I think, and I think Hamilton is wonderful because Hamilton is like the Harry Potter series for kids and for and young people readers, you know, that, that they've learned more about the 18th century from Hamilton than they have from anything else. And um, so, but the answer to your question is my daily schedule is to get up in the morning, get my coffee, sit down and read and try to bring myself back, not just as a tourist, 
but as a resident of a foreign country called the past. And the founders created a body of information that's almost endless. Think about it, that why did they do that? Because they knew they were important and they knew they were present at the creation. They weren't sure about the hereafter. They weren't sure there was a heaven or hell. Um, but the only way for them to live forever was in our memory. They're writing to us. They're writing to posterity. And I've spent my, you know, 35 years spending three or four hours a day when my dogs don't bark at me and dr drive me away trying to live in that world. And then when I come out of it, bring as much of the knowledge that I can with me to the ongoing, I'm a citizen alive at the 21st century too. Um, and um, uh, as a teacher, I think what I conveyed was a, a recognition that until you are prepared to understand the past and this moment in the past on its own terms, you can't make judgments about it. You have to learn how to think differently. And so like, you don't go to London and criticize the British for speaking with a foreign accent, right? You learn how, you know, you, you and, um, and historians are doing anthropology through time. Um, and the ability to think in terms of a different culture is like learning to speak with a different language. And it's a, it's a very, very good thing to have, it seems to me, especially in our own time. And now let's look at this. I'm gonna give you two questions that are not quite related, but you can figure out how to put them together. The founding fathers, you assert, were doing, dealing with revolutionary ideas for their time, middle-class, elected officials, democracy, mm -hmm. Um, what are the revolutionary issues of our time that mm. we ought to be debating? And how did that, their understanding of the revolutionary nature of their work mm. cross when they chose the term, we the people, as opposed mm. to we the states? Let me just grab on that one. It's a great question. And it's, a, it's the kind of thing we should all be arguing about every day and you get her off. Um, the term we the people was written by Governor Morris. Nobody knows who Governor Morris is. He was representative from Pennsylvania, even though he lived in New York. He was a peg legged guy. He was famous for his wit and his uh, unfortunate um, interest in other people's wives. But um, there was a committee on the, for drafting the constitution and every state was represented. represented. Rhode Island wasn't there because it boy boycotted. So there's 12 states, but they appointed, Madison and Hamilton agreed to appoint Governor Morris to rewrite the document. Here's how the document read before he rewrote it. We the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and then down the Atlantic coast. We, the people of those states. He changed it. It's the single most important editorial change in American history. It just says, we, the people of the United States. That's the whole issue at debate throughout the convention between the nationalists and the confederationists, whether we should think of ourselves as citizens of the United States or of particular states or even particular counties within states. Um, so uh, that, that's, a rea that's how that right now, one of the legacies of the founding is an ongoing argument about whether government is us or government is them. That's an ongoing argument. It's, it's the central argument that it bequeathed to us. It's still with us. Ronald Reagan used to say, and it was, and Reagan was crucial in altering the American narrative from the New Deal to a Republican conservative point of view. Namely, if someone from the federal government came to you 
you know, it said, how can I help? You start to run away. Well, but suppose somebody comes with a vaccine to, sh to give you an in inoculation. Suppose someone comes with $4,000 to help you get through the, uh, the pandemic. Um, what we're facing in the Biden administration and its disagreements with the Republican major or Senate is a disagreement about whether the government is us or them. We are also facing a challenge to what we perceive to be a assured goal, common goal, as a biracial society. The founders couldn't do it, but by the middle of the 20th century, the United States committed itself to becoming a biracial, now multiracial society. Uh, we now know, after the Trump presidency, that a much larger percentage of the white population does not want that to happen. Um, and regards Martin Luther King's dream as a nightmare. There are more of them than we realized. Um, and that's what's going on in the various states that are attempting to restrict voting right now. Um, those are legacies of the founding that we still need to argue about. And, uh, and, uh, and my, my prejudices are clear. I mean, I'm on the side of us and I'm on the side of Martin Luther King. Now, I have sorted this out so that our very last question goes, comes from our distinguished board member, Ron Elving. And I think he gives us a question that really frames where do we go from here? Hmm. Most of us have presumed for all of our lives or most of our lives that the union as we know it will continue in this hmm. present form. But that seems less certain now than at any time in living memory. Can you imagine a future where the current arrangement would break apart? And what, what would that mean? Um, the union, if you capitalize union, you know, the only time where we faced a set of challenges which are as threatening as they appear to be now is the Civil War. Um, I, um, and I'm, historians are great at prophesying the past, <laughs> but they're no better than anybody else at the future. We're really almost omniscient in prophesying the past. I can tell you what's going to happen in the Civil War. I can tell you who's going to win the debate in the Constitutional Convention. I can tell you who's going to win the American Revolution. Um, I can't tell you who, uh, you know, how the, how the Senate's going to uh, behave on the infrastructure issue or whether the a uh, group of people who invaded the Capitol uh, are going to be declared insurrectionists or not. I think they are, but um, I think that if you the historians look at patterns and the pattern that I'm trying to read into the present is that we come together in crises. We're going through a political crisis now, um, but I think the crisis that is going to hit us, it is already hitting us, that's going to force we, and to some extent, the nations of the world to come together in a way they never have before, is the threat to the existence of the planet. And I think that climate change, global warming, is going to force that. Um, and I think that most of my descendants and maybe yours are going to look back 50 years from now when the coasts are flooded, New York's evacuated, New Orleans is underwater and Miami's underwater, the Middle West is dry, and they're going to say, what were they doing in the, in the, two, in the beginning of the 21st century to, 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 to avert this or to make it help happen, to, to, to take action earlier? In the same way that we look back at the founders and say, what were they doing when they let slavery stay, stay in place? It will look just as impossible to them that we, we were delinquent as, it, as the founders now look to us with regard to slavery. But that's an encouraging note in the sense we are going to come together because we're not going to have any other choice but to so do. 
Well, Dr. Ellis, you are fascinating. So the final question is mine. Will you come back and talk about your next book when it comes out? I'd love to. And I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope I didn't upset too many people. And I hope I created a framework in which different people can come together and continue the dialogue. We will continue this for sure. This is exactly the kind of dialogue that the United States Capitol Historical Society is dedicated to. When we were created, um, next year will be our 60th year, uh, the authorizing legislation charged us with, with creating an inspired patriotism, an inspired mm. and informed patriotism. And you have given us information to inspire that debate and to inform us as we move forward, because as we celebrate the 4th of July, whether it was really the 4th or the 28th or August 2nd, <laughs> the 4th is a designated <laughs> birthday where we honor the values of this country. And we thank you very much for and, and, your time. You know, everybody on the 4th, just read the following words to each other. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what we share together as Americans. Well, thank you. And just to quickly answer people's questions, yes, there is a recording of this webinar. Um, it is available um, and you will get a notice about it. And so it will be available through our website. Um, this is the first time we have been recording live on Facebook. Um, and so you can share it through Facebook. There are many opportunities for this to be shared with your friends, neighbors, and we always have to have our small commercial. Uh, these webinars are brought to you by the United States Capitol Historical Society only because of the support of our members and donors. We are a nonprofit organization that exists solely on the contributions of dedicated supporters like yours. So if you found this to be inspiring, please consider becoming a member um, and making a contribution. We have some upcoming events that we would like to share with you. Um, as we, we've been doing an ongoing series about the Capitol itself. Um, as you know, right now, uh, we are un unable to go in there for tours. So we've been trying to provide sort of virtual tours. And on the 13th, uh, our very own Steve Livengood, who's the chief tour guide of the Capitol Historical Society, will talk about the Cox Corridors, um, which was the latest uh, addition to the mur murals at the corridors um, on, the, on the house side, um, we actually, contributed by the United States Capitol Historical Society. And he will talk about those corridors and what is depicted there. And on the 27th, we are gonna be talking specifically about our own work. What we realized is that over the course of this last pandemic year, teachers just struggled trying to find resources. And the Capitol Historical Society put together a We the People uh, Constitution Tour Hub, which provides civic education tools in a virtual format that are now available for educators across the country. And as we were talking with people about it, we realized that we hadn't really taken the time to tell our own story. So for those of you who are a teacher, know a teacher, have a student, um, or just believe in civic education. We hope you'll join us on, on July 27th to learn about the We the People Constitution Tour uh, Civic Education Hub. And so you'll know that that resource can be available. And finally, on August 10th, we will talk about William Coston, uh, who is an African-American distinguished leader, um, there are stories that are not still 100% clear. He may have been an enslaved person, enslaved to the Washington family. But in any event, he was an African-American who became a leader in early Washington, um, including serving at the Bank of Washington. He owned a home on what is now Capitol Hill. And so we always try to bring unsung heroes, heroes and heroines who you may not otherwise have known. 
So we thank you very much for joining us, and we encourage you to have a wonderful uh, holiday to remember the strong values of this country, and thank you again for your support. Have a good day.